Great. Um, right. Um, so I actually need this. Uh, great. So I am going to communicate to you a an algorithm that you're unlikely to use directly as much, but you uh, with big data, high velocity data but which will be absolutely essential for building an understanding of the, the crown jewel of these methods that we're going to be talking about in the boot camp, which is PMCMC. Okay. PMCMC is a combination of particle filtering on the one hand and Markov chain Monte Carlo approaches on the other. Particle filtering within the context of the PMCMC algorithm is going to uh, allow us to basically sample from the latent state, as we are familiar with over time. Um, so particle filtering you can think of as a lens that allows you to look at a time series from the world and see, projected from that, what it means in terms of the latent state of the system that gave rise to that, to that time series, one or more time series. It allows us to transform sort of what we see in a time series into what it means for the latent state of a model that plausibly gives rise to it. MCMC is going to be a tool that lets us look at data from the world in the context of a model and see what it implies about distributions for parameters of that model. Okay? It will, the joint distribution over parameters we're interested in estimating. So it provides us this way of kind of eliciting from evidence we have about the world, what does that imply? If, if the model explains this, this data, what does it imply about the values of the parameters that must obtain, that must uh, hold? And starting in 2013 with Dr. Liu, um, we began exploring the use of MCMC with, with uh, dynamic models. And we have publications in this area and, and conference publications. So. To, to sort of talk about these, I need to remind you that, that particle filtering does different things than calibration. Um, particle filtering does different things than MCMC. MCMC and calibration are focused on parameter estimation. They're focused on estimating the parameters for our dynamic models in light of data. What does that data tell us about what these parameters must be? That's what we're trying to figure out in calibration, that's what we're trying to figure out in MCMC, where MCMC gives us a, a joint distribution. Particle filtering gave us something different. It gave us an understanding of the latent state. Calibration is a time-honored way for estimating parameter values. It involves sort of tuning parameters to best match the data. But often it, it leaves us in a kind of flat way with a point estimate of parameter values. That's better than nothing. You know, we estimate the probabilities, the ways in which the beta is associated with wind and with temperature and with rainfall on probability of estimating a mosquito or something like that. Um, uh, so it gives us these, these point estimates, right? It, it might allow us, for example, to, um, to estimate uh, several parameters within this model. And uh, here, we're going to take a model that produces data over time and try to estimate the parameters of the simulation model, here P and C, that gave rise to it. Okay? So we have some data over time. That's the, uh, that's the uh, values in red here. And we have a simulation model. And we want to know if, a, if this simulation model is a good descriptor of the real world system that gave rise to these these red data points, what were the values of P and C that allowed it to do so? Okay, um, that's, that's the idea here. Traditional calibration provides point estimates for these. It tells us P was approximately this and C was approximately that, okay? Um, the limitations here is, you know, are, are multiple. Um, single point estimates give no sense of variability. Um, even given some estimate, like a, a covariance matrix around there, the strong limitations, particularly for models that are nonlinear, you have 
you have this assumption of unimodality with this point estimate of covariance matrix. It doesn't take into account there may be different basins of attraction. Um, and it turns out that you can't translate these directly into output measures like intervention gains and in a covariance matrix for intervention gains, uncertainty <coughs> about intervention gains. Um, and uh, there's a set of other limitations I won't go into, but also the assumption of a single dynamic model. Um, so what we're going to see here with MCMC is a technique that allows us to estimate those parameter values without committing to one value. It'll actually allow us to estimate the distribution, the joint distribution over these parameters, recognizing maybe if P is high, that means C has to be low and vice versa, for example. Or if C is high, it means C, B, uh, C is high, P is high as well, or both are low. Um, it allows us to capture this, this sort of variation between them and in a global way. We might have something that's nonlinear. For example, we might have this, right? Something like, well, C can be quite high, but in those cases, P has got to be low, or P can be quite high and C has to be low. And here, this is not a nice normally distributed value. Instead, it runs along this ridge. And trying to, trying to get a sense of that, these dependencies using traditional calibration is very difficult. Very difficult. Cheryl? Okay. No, okay. Yeah. So we're going to talk about um, these parameter values in a brief notation. Okay. It's going to be a succinct notation. We're going to call whatever vector parameter values you want to estimate, we, we're going to call it theta. And I, I put a little, a little arrow over to indicate it's a vector. Okay. So this might be a two vector as it is here. Um, uh, it might be a, a set of six quantities, in which case it would, it would also be represented as theta. This theta is a vector. It's a bundle of these things in some ordered way, okay? Um, and MCMC is a principled, powerful, general way of generating samples, of, of estimating the distribution for these parameters, the joint distribution uh, uh, in, in light of the data. So it, we're sampling from a posterior distribution over theta in light of the evidence. So we have a model, we have some evidence, and we want to ask, given that evidence, what does this imply for us about the value of theta? We may bring to it a certain prior distribution for what these values probably are, but the evidence together with the model will imply a, a distribution, um, a posterior distribution over theta um, that's implied in, li in light of that evidence in the model, okay? And the idea here is we're going to, we're going to be able to study this distribution by sampling from it. We, we can't just draw it out because in general maybe seven dimensions, eight dimensions or something like that. And we can't conveniently characterize it in a nice parametric way because it might result from a nonlinear model and have weird shapes associated with it. But what we can do is sample from it. So we'll have a whole bunch of samples from different values where, where that distribution is quite large, has a high density or high probability, we'll sample many times from it and those where it is low density will sample less, right? Um, and the samples will kind of collectively be a pretty good representation of, of, of the distribution, okay? And then for each sample, for example, we could accumulate statistics. So we might, as we sample from it, take the mean and use that to approximate the mean of the distribution, or we take the median, or whatever, in terms of some value. Um, or we might say, uh, record the sample for later use, for example, to plug it in so we can perform intervention analyses with different sample values will say, how does intervention A compare to intervention B? And we'll get out trade-offs between them over different legitimate assumptions about what those parameters are. And, in, and that will induce distributions over the, uh, the value of uh, intervention A compared to B. Okay? Um, so this is what we're going to do with MCMC. We're going to be able to sample from a distribution over C and P here. Over, over these parameters that's implied by the data in the model. So again, it's like we have a lens. You know, I, we have a, a, a 
a device which we bought many years ago for the lab, which allows us to look at, for example, a scene and see the heat in the scene in front of us. So we turn um, the scene into a picture of the heat distribution here. Or we might have a lens in some cases which takes a time series and we see the Fourier transform of the time series. This is a technique which allows us, given a model, it allows us to look at some data from the world and see what it implies upon the distribution of parameter values for that model. Okay? Okay, now, um, a more sophisticated technique, which we'll be getting into in the fullness of time, is use it to choose different models. But for that, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to describe that here. Okay, so it turns out, you may ask, what's this MCMC fancy name? Well, it's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's Markov, uh, Markov uh, it's, Mon uh, it's Monte Carlo because it's sampling many times. It's Markov Chain because a Markov Chain is used to generate um, to samples from this distribution. So how does this work? Okay, basically these are the things you need to do to perform MCMC sampling, to approximate this distribution for your model. You need to assign some prior distribution over parameters, okay? Um, uh, and it might be parametric, it might not be parametric, but basically you're gonna have a prior distribution you start with that sort of represents your, any preconceived notion about, that you have about the value of parameters, okay? And then you're gonna formulate a likelihood function. This is gonna be basically the same process we saw for particle filtering, same principles. Often we're gonna use the same type of distribution, negative binomial or binomial or whatever, okay? Um, and that likelihood function, as for particle filtering, it's going to relate what's the likelihood of observing this observed data from the world we're trying to make sense of in light of the model given those parameter values. So it's going to say, if you use these, parameter, these parameters, these particular parameters in this model, what's the likelihood you would observe that empirical data? And if you do these others, what's the likelihood you would observe that empirical data? And I'll give you a hint. To compute this, this likelihood, in this kind of context, you almost always have to run the model. Because the parameters are gonna drive the model, and the parameters will drive the model output, and given the model output, that'll be a lot closer, something you could then compare with the empirical data. And so, to, to evaluate this likelihood, you're gonna be running the simulation model, okay? And then, having done this, there's a, there's a application of Bayes rule you apply, which I'll remind you about, which basically allows you to turn around a likelihood that specifies the likelihood of observing Y given theta. In other words, the likelihood of observing this given a set of parameter values. Given that in a prior, you can turn around and say, what's, we can, we can have something that's just proportional to the probability of theta given Y. Which, which basically is, is allows us to uh, arrive at a, a posterior distribution. We'll get to that. Okay, so MCMC, a Markov chain genera is going to use to generate possible values of theta, but we're only gonna accept some of them according to how good they are, okay? Um, and, um, and for each generated param uh, uh, parameter sample, each one that's actually accepted, that's, as we say, emitted, we're going to sample output measures and statistics. Okay. Okay, so assign prior distributions um, before calibration or, or MCMC estimates. Often we have some sense of parameters, and we can specify it with a prior. Okay. Sometimes we use very simple ones, like a minimally informative prior, like a uniform prior. Um, uh, sometimes we have a, a probability distribution, like a normal distribution, that we think might bound the possible values pretty well. Um, it, some people do use MCMC in a non-Bayesian fashion um, without a prior, um, but uh, with Bayesian approaches, one of the big attractions is you can specify some prior and, and, and use it to capture you know, what your expectations are. So our prior, our prior here for this little example is we're estimating C and P, you may remember, for this model we saw earlier, right? This model here. We have C used up here, it's a contact rate, and we're going to have a probability P, which is the probability of reporting of a person. This is long before we were doing particle filtering in my group, and we tried this as an approach for doing some similar things. 
So we have a probability of reporting. Um, so here, our parameter vector, call it theta, you should get used to that notation, is C as a vector of C and P. It's just a pair, right? So for this set of this possible parameter, we'll have a certain value of C and a certain value of P. Okay? Um, we're going to compare two priors here. One is an uninformative prior where it's just uniform everywhere. One is a misleading prior which we've chosen to be somewhat biased, somewhat off. Okay? And we're going to see the degree to which it biases our results or to which our results are robust because of the degree, the amount of evidence. Okay, so we, we have some priors and you have a lot of freedom in choosing prior, priors. Parametric, non-parametric, what have you. <coughs> the second approach, or the second step, Conceptually, this is all before the algorithm. We just have to specify these things. We're going to formulate likelihood functions that will indicate the likelihood of seeing particular empirical data in light of values of parameters and the model. And typically, this requires running the model on some or all of these parameters. Some might not apply to the model. They're more like after the model runs, like probability of reporting. Um, but basically, they, uh, this likelihood will be saying, given these parameters, say C and P, what's the likelihood that I would see this empirical data, in this case over time, in other cases it may be just point estimates, okay? Um, and these likelihood functions, as we'll see, are familiar beasts, okay? Um, a likelihood function has to be specified here. Um, we, we write it this way. This is should be very familiar to you from the particle context. There we are taking likelihoods given the state values with particles. Here we're taking the likelihood given, given parameter values and the model, okay? We're saying if we had a model, if we have our model with this certain parameter uh, assumption, what's the likelihood we would see? What's the likelihood that that would lead to a situation where we'd see this um, uh, this uh, set of empirical data. Okay? So this, this likelihood function reflects basically a, a key value in judging the degree to which a certain set of parameters are plausible. Right? If we, if with our model, these parameters lead to something wildly off from what we see from the world, we'll say, oh, this is very likely, unlikely to occur. On the other hand, if we see something very consistent with the world, that's quite likely to occur. And what we want to do here a sample from, from values of these that are plausible, that are, you know, according to their plausibility. We want to sample more for those that are more plausible and less for those that are less plausible. For our example, we're going to take something like a binomial distribution for reasons that I alluded to early, early on we started using these. It's a binomial distribution. It'll last, look, if we have this many people infected and each person has this many this likelihood of being reported, um, what's the likelihood we would see this many people reported? Okay? Um, here we're assuming the reporting interval is such you never get the same person twice. Maybe you report once a month and flu lasts for a week. So we have this many people report who are sick at the beginning of the month. Uh, maybe it's 100 people sick. The probability maybe is 0.5. And we have uh, an observation of, say, 40 people sick. And we'll say, what's the likelihood, if we assume it's binomially distributed, each person is a coin flip, what's the likelihood if we had 100 people, 100 coin flips, and we flipped a coin for each, that we'd see 40 people, um, 40 people infected? Now, we, we multiply this. This is a product over all observations. So for each observation, we have, um, we have some number of people that are infected as implied by running the model on the parameters, the parameter vector theta. And we're going to ask at that time, if that many people were infected, what's the probability? And we had this reporting probability, which is another element to the parameter vector. What's the probability we would have seen the empirical data at that data point? Again, MCMC can be used on data that's not over time. In this particular case, we did consider value data that was over time. You may remember it. It's this data over time here. Okay. So we were, this is kind of all pre-particle filtering, and we were trying to see how well it would apply in that case. So the idea here is 
we have a likelihood that will say, what's the likelihood if we assume this parameter value in our model that we would exceed the, the data, all of the data. And here, typically within our theta, there's one or more parameters that are used in the model. We'll run the model on those parameters. And, and they're fixed. They're fixed all through the simulation, like C. But then there may be some parameters in this, in this data that are not in the simulation model per se, like reporting probability. And we use that in our, in our likelihood function here to say, if we saw this many people, the model predicts this many people being sick in total, and we had this many, this probability of being reported, what's, if, if we assume a binomial distribution, what's the likelihood we'd observe this, um, this many uh, heads? Um, if we flip 100 coins, each having a probability of 0.5, that we, what's the probability we observe 40? And we do that for every data point. That's odd here. Okay? Um, okay. So, having done that, gone through there, the, what remains here before we, we run the algorithm is we need Bayes' rule. So, some of you may remember Bayes' rule from school. If you don't, don't fear. Okay? Um, Bayes' rule is something that results very straightforwardly from a little factoid. Okay? If you have... Ladies and gentlemen, if you have P of AB, okay, um, probability of A and B being the case, you can put a comma between them if you want to, this is equal to P of A given B times P of B, okay? okay. It, 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 it turns out that we have that easy equivalence. And given that, we can express this in, in two different ways. And if you multiply through on both sides of the equation, if we, you know, I, I will further just note that here we're saying what's the probability of, of A being the case and B being the case, and we'll treat that as completely equal to probability of BA, okay? And if you multiply both sides here, if you take this P of Y and you multiply it on the left, you, you multiply both sides by it. It cancels out here, so on the right you have is, uh, is the numerator. On the left side you have P of theta given Y times P of Y. That, by the same formula, that turns into P of theta Y, you know, both being the case. And over here you have the same thing. So it just falls out of this equivalent. But it was noted by uh, Thomas Bayes, who was a remarkably insightful early, um, early probabilist. And the thing to realize here is, is the significance of these terms. These, this may look like an odd factoid here, but this is the likelihood function. That's the probability of observing y given theta, given the parameters theta. If we have parameters data applying, like we run the model on it, what's the likelihood we'll observe y? Um, this p of theta is just a prior distribution, okay? Um, and if we consider the fact this is the, the probability the data obtains. Now we only have we're only handed data. We're not considering anything that uh, changes assumptions about the data. So we are trying to find theta in light of a fixed y. So if we consider this as a function of theta, we, or we only have a fixed y, this, this will be the same value in any case. And what this means is this is some constant. We don't know what it is, but it doesn't really matter in the end for our purposes because what this is saying is this is equal to some constant times that, okay? So, so here, we have a situation where on the left-hand side here, so the, the right-hand side, as we said, is the likelihood times a prior, okay? This is a prior distribution over theta, which we get to choose, right? I said earlier, um, it's uniform, or it's normal, or it's whatever, we choose it. P of theta, as P of y given theta is, so this is the prior, I should 
and did I say likelihood? But yeah, I, I meant to say prior, we, which we can choose. This is the likelihood here, p of theta of y given theta. This is this is the likelihood function. It says, given a theta, what's the likelihood we will observe y? And this multiplication is proportional to this. And this is none other than the what? Can anyone say? The posterior. Given that we've observed y, what is, what is the probability of different theta given that we've observed y? This is the theta. So, so, so this is the posterior here on the left. And it's proportional times it's proportional to the likelihood times the prior, okay, um, uh, for a given theta um, in, a, in a given y. Okay, so for our case, we've chosen a likelihood of this sort. It's not a privilege. We could have chosen any number of different likelihoods, but here we made use of a familiar one, binomial one here, okay, where we have some y, which is observed data. We have some value here generated by the model given theta. And we have some p here, which is from theta. It's, it's part of theta, the, theta c and p. The c is used to run the model. The p is, is, is just the value from, from theta. And then p of theta we chose here for one of our cases to be uniform uh, within this range and zero up plus. OK? OK. Um, Okay, so um, here, this is the likelihood, this is the prior, okay? And MCMC will take huge advantage of this in computing the posterior. But we're not out of the woods yet. We need to generate samples from theta that are somehow distributed according to this. We want to sample more thetas where this is high. We want to arrive at plausible thetas, right? We want to have plausible thetas. We want to sample lots of thetas where this is really high. We want to sample few thetas where this is low. And it turns out for our case, in order to calculate this likelihood, we're going to need to run the simulation model. So doing this, sampling from this, requires to run our simulation model, OK? Again and again for different values of theta. OK. Um, so why do we want to use a Markov chain to generate these samples? So I said earlier, we're going to, we want to sample thetas, lots of thetas where that posterior is high. This guy is high, and we want to sample a few where it's low. Why do we use a Markov chain? Why is it Markov chain Monte Carlo? Well, um, we don't have the luxury of knowing the shape of this distribution in advance. Amongst other things, for us, we may have a nonlinear model which is associated with this likelihood function. In order to figure out how likely is it that I'll see this observed data y given theta, which includes, say, c, and maybe many other parameters in general, how am I going to know how likely it is for a given c that I see those observations without running the model on c and c, running the model on, 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 on c and observing those empirical data and saying, how close are they? I need to run the model on C in order to see, if I can pun. Um, OK, um, so, so here we, we don't know ahead of time what the shape of that is. We, can't, we don't know what the shape of this is. We can't compute a cumulative distribution function. Um, the Markov chain approach is going to allow us to savvily generate thetas from a posterior without knowing its commutative distribution function in advance, OK? So here, what we're going to do is we're going to use this Markov chain operation, OK? And basically, what's going to happen, we're going to again and again and again do a simple step, OK? Um, we're going to draw. We're going to have a value of theta that's worked, OK? And from that value of theta that's worked, and for any value of theta, we can calculate. Here's the thing. For any value of theta, we can calculate what this is. How do we calculate? We just multiply. We, we, know so, we can calculate something proportional to this. Um, and that's all we need. All, how do we calculate the thing proportional to it? We just multiply the value of the posterior for that theta times, and then we run the simulation model on that theta, and we observe 
the results um, and we evaluate this likelihood function. We say, given those results and any other values of theta that are needed, um, what's the likelihood we would observe the empirical data? And so we could calculate the likelihood, we can calculate the prior, we multiply them and we can get something proportional to, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, posterior. And so for a given theta, we can calculate something proportional to the posterior. So here, what we're going to do is, if we have a value that's worked already, we'll find a value to start with that's work, that works, okay? That, that we have a non-zero posterior. We find some value where it's a posterior value is non-zero, okay? Um, sometimes we seed it with that. And then we draw a candidate value from that, that we think might also happen. Often we just perturb theta. We just nudge it a little bit. We add something to it. We, we add a random vector to it. We get something nearby. We say, maybe this will work, okay? Um, and then we decide that that gives us what's called the candidate value, theta star, okay? It's a candidate. We haven't said it's a, it's a, it's a real uh, sample yet. Theta was, the, the theta we, we had was the sample, and we want to get another sample, but first we got to consider candidates. And not every candidate will become a sample, right? Um, so here, we'll start with a candidate by perturbing theta. And then we will typically, and then we'll basically go to assess its, its posterior value, something proportional to posterior. So here we run the simulation model on that candidate we will arrive and, and we'll use that to calculate together with any other elements of that parameter vector theta star, we'll calculate the likelihood for that theta star. And then we'll multiply it times the value of the, po the prior at theta star, okay? Um, and that will give us something proportional in value to the posterior, okay? And then we will consider the ratio between that at the candidate between p of y given theta star times p of theta star, in other words, the thing proportional to posterior, and we'll consider the ratio of that to p of y given theta times p of theta. In other words, the, the ratio of the values of the posterior at the candidate point and the current point. Um, and if it is greater than one, we'll accept it. If it's less than one, we'll only accept it with a probability, if it's, in other words, between zero and one, we'll accept it with a probability that's given by that ratio. So maybe it's 0 0.8, and we'll flip a coin, well, we'll roll the dice, we'll generate a random number between zero and one. If it's less than 0 0.8, we accept it. Um, if that new candidate has a very low posterior compared to the current point, maybe it's 0 0.01, we'll only accept it with a probability of 0 0.01. Otherwise, we will just re-emit re-emit, reissue, sample again from, in other words, we will, we will have another sample at the current point. The, this sample will be from the current point, it won't be from the standard point. We'll prefer the current point and issue it again. So what this means is, if we have a, if we have a current point theta that's really, really good, and every candidate around it is really poor compared to it, we'll tend to sample from the one that's really good a lot, and we'll only go occasionally to those candidates. But we will go sometimes, even if the candidate is a lower value, we may go there sometimes with, say, 1% probability, which guarantees a certain exploration. And it turns out this will allow us to sample from the posterior distribution. This is exactly, it'll, it'll repeat many things when it's high and other things when, um, when, it's, uh, when it's low. So imagine, imagine this. Well, here's the algorithm written out a little more, okay, we, we pick an initial value until some convergence criteria is satisfied, and you can use Heidelberg-Welch, or you can use many walkers convergence, etc. You'll pick a, you'll start with some value, you pick a perturbation from the last value that was successful, the last, the last sample, you create a candidate value by adding this perturbation. This is called metrop uh, random walk metropolis Hastings, which is a common one. You, you add uh, a perturbation, uh, a kind of, you, you kick it a bit, you add a nudge to it, and you get a candidate. That's, that's this guy here. Um, I wrote it with an arrow and a little tilde hat. I could have used a star. 
And then we'll evaluate the posterior at that candidate compared to the posterior at the current point, that the last sample that, that we've had, the current sample. And uh, if we'll draw a value between 0 and 1. If it's less than this, this minimum of 1 in this thing, if it's less than it, we accept it. Otherwise, we'll reject it. Okay. So if this value, posterior at the new point, the candidate in, over the current point, is very, very small, we'll accept it with very small probability. If this value, if the candidate point is actually better posterior than the current point, we will always accept it, we'll always go there. If it's equal, right, if it's equal, we'll always go there as well, okay? Um, and uh, it's only if it's lower, we'll only occasionally go there, okay? And then we'll emit, and notice if we don't go to the candidate, if we reject the candidate, we just, our sample is the last one we have. We'll just repeat it. So we tend to repeat things that are really good, which is what we want. When we're sampling from posterior, we want to have more things where it's really high and fewer things where it's, it, it, the, the value to posterior is really low. We want many samples from high posterior points, few samples from low posterior points. Okay? So imagine this. Here, imagine that we want to recognize this curve. <laughs> you can see why I copied it to that other slide. Um, here's my, my curve, right? I want a sample from this distribution. By the way, you see. This is another way of sampling from a weird distribution. Important sampling is one way of sampling from a weird distribution. And so is Marco Chain Monte Carlo. It's a, weird, it's a way of sampling from a weird posterior that we can't necessarily specify ahead of time. All we can guarantee is that at a given point, we can calculate the posterior. My calculate the prior times the light there. Um, we can't necessarily draw it out, but I've drawn it out for convenience, OK? So suppose we want to sample from this weird distribution. By the way, particle filtering won't work with, with uh, you, can't do plus, you can't do particle filtering effectively with MCMC. It, oh, we could talk about it later, uh, tomorrow if you want to. But suppose we want to sample from this weird distribution, okay? So we want to sample values that if we plot them out in a histogram, even with many, many bins, will really well approximate this distribution, right? So we want to sample from it in a way that will give us a really good sense of this distribution, this set of, set of samples. So we want to sample from this blue distribution, um, but we can't do it directly. Maybe we don't even know what it looks like. All we can do is, uh, if you tell me theta, a certain theta, I can tell you what that value is, but I can't tell you overall what its shape is and stuff like that. Okay, um, maybe it's many dimensional, huge number of dimensions. Okay, um, so we have a current point with this algorithm. At any one point, we have a current point. For simplicity, I've written it as, as, as theta. This is kind of the notation here. Okay. Um, so this is our current point. Maybe we started here, right? Or uh, maybe this was just our last sample. Okay. We know the value at the current point, the value at the posterior. I'm just going to write it P of theta. Okay. Um, that's the value of the posterior, or something proportional to the value. Uh, the constants of proportionality cancel when you consider the ratio, okay, the P of Y. So this is the value at the current point, and we consider a candidate that's a perturbation. We, we sort of kick it a little bit. We nudge it a little bit, and oh, okay, here's our candidate, theta star. And the question is here, what's the value of P of theta star divided by P of theta, okay? Um, if that value, P of theta star divided by P of theta is greater, we'll always accept that. We'll always move there. And that will become our next point, our next sample, and that will be our sample. If P of theta is less, let's suppose P of theta were this trough here. We ended up in this trough, right? We, we perturb theta and we end up here, right? Right there. Um, Will we ever move there? Will we ever sample that? Yeah, we'll sample that. Maybe, you know, the value of the posterior at the trough divided by the value of the posterior at P of theta, maybe it's point, I'm, I'm just looking at it, maybe it's point 0.7. So there's actually a 70% chance we may move there, right? So we may 
when they move there despite the fact that it's low? Well, well, if the candidate is, and, and that would allow us to emit it. By contrast, if we, um, if we reject that, we'll just re-emit theta as our point, okay? So we'll tend to have a lot of repeats, repeats from the current place where the current place is good. We'll tend to have very few repeats from the current place where the current place is bad, um, you know, as a, as a low posterior. So we're gonna move around in this. We're gonna move around in this exploring this distribution and we'll tend to dwell sampling many times in places that are pretty good and we'll tend to under you know not spend much time in places that are bad news that, are, that have low posterior right and because we still accept even if it's smaller sometimes relative to our current we'll tend to go even to some places that are pretty small but we'll sample a lot in the places that are high and as was proven by the creator of this, Metropolis and Metropolis Hastings, this samples from the posterior. This is a way of sampling from this posterior. Given any weird function, even in many, many dimensions, we, we can sample from it okay? um, in this way, in this simple, simple way. Now, what does all this have to do with with um, simulation models. Um, well, well, again, I mean, if, if we emphasize it here, this whole process of evaluating P of theta at the current point or at a candidate point, in order to evaluate the candidate point, which will then become our current point if we accept it, we need to run the simulation model. Why do we need to run the simulation model? Because we're evaluating the posterior at that candidate and we're comparing it with the posterior at our current point. Generally, we won't reevaluate it at a current point. We'll just remember it from when we did last. But we need to calculate this posterior at this candidate point. Why do we need to run a simulation model to calculate the posterior? Because the posterior value is proportional to, and we just calculated up to this value of proportionality, because the P of Y that's in the denominator here uh, will cancel in the numerator and denominator, so we don't need to worry about the P of Y. Um, uh, we, in order to calculate this posterior, in other words, in order to calculate this, we will need to we will need to compute the value of the posterior, uh, the prior at that point. Well, that's something we've chosen, but this P of Y given theta star. The value of the um, of that likelihood here, in order to judge that, in order to say, what's the probability we will observe this many reported sick people at this time, given a value of C and P? In order to calculate that, we're going to need to run the simulation model because we need to know how many. If I assume a certain value of C. How many sick people will there truly be in the underlying situation at time t? And then I'm going to have to ask with a binomial distribution, what's the likelihood, given that true number of sick people, that I'd observe the number of y as given by y um, for that, um, uh, given the value of c, that's what led to the simulation output, and the value of p. Does that make sense? Are people following this? Okay, um, I see enough nodding heads <laughs> that, that, uh, that um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful. Um, uh, enough heads nodding in the right way. So, um, so here, in order to calculate this likelihood, we need to run the simulation model. We run the simulation model, and then we go when we calculate the value of our prior, of our sort of likelihood function according to this, using the simulation model output. And that gives us, and then we can just multiply it by the value of the prior for this, which we, we had specified, right? Um, and we end up from that calculating something, oops, uh, proportional to the posterior. And we have the existing thing proportional to the posterior. They differ only by the same constant factor in front, therefore it cancels, and therefore we can compute this ratio, and therefore we can evaluate this ratio divided by that and go there, or not. 
right? By this flip of the coin, okay, with a certain probability. Um, and this whole process allows you to explore this and allows you to explore it when the likelihood is dictated by a simulation model, okay? Um, so in our case, you know, well, back in the day, we implemented an interface. Now it's been built into BenSim. And often you have to run many M MCMC iterations. What are we doing here? With particle filtering, we were, sam we were trying to sample from, to estimate the underlying latent state of the system, right? The full state of the system. Here, we're trying to sample from values of parameters that hold throughout the simulation that best account for the observed data, given the model. We're estimating parameter values, not latent states of the system. Um, now, you've got to run the, the model for those parameters, but you're not going and saying, uh, maybe the model's off, maybe actually the latent state is a bit higher than that or, or, or lower than that. You're not. Okay. Um, Okay, so, um, you know, here for this particular model, we actually did it, and we came out with a very fairly normal looking uh, values of, of C and P. This is for uniform prior, and this is for a highly biased prior. And what you can see is the effect of bias on the results are very, very modest here. With a uniform prior, we've got a, um, uh, a sort of a central tendency and an overall uh, an overall distribution around that, which is very very similar to what we get with the bias prior. In short, the empirical data overwhelmed the bias prior and and gave us a posterior very similar to what we'd expect with an unbiased prior. Okay, with a non-informative prior. Now, having done that, we now have a set of parameter values that are implied by this data in the world given the model, uh, but a distribution of them. And given that distribution, we could then run a distribution, we could run those and get a distribution over model outputs, different how the model changes over time, right? And we could run it forward from the current time and see what implies about the future. And here, um, for conventional calibration, you can't do this, but we could arrive at, for example, credibility intervals around the results of the model. We could look at differences between a baseline and intervention scenario. Given the uh, uncertainty about parameter values, we could see how much uncertainty does it induce in the difference between intervention A or intervention B or intervention A and, and the baseline value. Um, to a degree, you could view this as kind of interweaving calibration and sensitivity analysis, and that is giving you a sense of of um, what values of the parameters are, in, are implied by external data given a model, but it also gives you a sense of how much the results differ for different assumptions within those ranges of parameter values. So it's actually fairly um, kind of a mixture of, of benefits here. So here, the simulation model is a critical mediator between parameters and observed data because it allows us to calculate the likelihood function, okay? Um, and so generally, to calculate the likelihood function, we need to, uh, we need to calculate the, uh, the output of the model given the parameter vector theta. So there are a few um, uh, comments I just want to offer on the practical level. Um, one thing is, you need to run typically large, as we say, chains. You need to run the model for many, many samples, like a thousand, before you really start getting a good sampling from the underlying distribution. Because otherwise, it's very biased by your initial starting point. So you need to kind of run it until it's fairly well mixed. It's sampling from the distribution. So you're going to be looking for a longer burn-in period. And there's ways of judging the size of the burn-in period that's appropriate. Now, where there's a Goldilocks principle in a big way, and where it carries over to PMCMC. By the way, the stuff I've been describing carries over greatly to PMCMC. We'll, we'll see this with PMCMC tomorrow in a big way. But the basic deal is there's a Goldilocks because you want to explore this distribution, 
um, nicely. And you want to go and explore it really well. If you choose nudges that are too small, you know, if I change the value of theta by a pixel at a time, I'm going to be spending a lot of effort to get any sort of distance here. And it will take a long time to explore that. On the other hand, when I so do, when in so doing, if I move it by just a pixel, uh, assuming a sort of nice smooth function here, the ratio of the new point, the posterior at the new point, at the candidate point, compared to the ratio, uh, compared to the value of the posterior at the current point, so p of theta divided by p, p of theta star divided by p of theta, if I just move it by a pixel at a time, p of theta star divided by p of theta, they'll be almost the same. They'll be very close to each other, right? Moving it over from here to here, right? Their ratio will be just about one. What does that mean in terms of accepting or rejecting that value? It means I'm going to what? Almost always accept it. So moving a tiny bit will lead to very high acceptance rate. But it'll, at the cost of not really exploring quickly. By contrast, if I willy-nilly have a big perturbation, like I knock it out here and I knock it out there a lot of the time, I'm often not going to be accepting it. Because I'll, I'll get it out here and p of theta star is going to be close to zero. P of theta is going to be pretty big. Dividing the two is going to yield something extremely small. And if I take the ratio here, it's going to yield to something that's close to zero. And the minimum of one in that is going to be close to zero. So the, the chance that I'll accept it, it's not zero, but it's extremely small, right? Oops. Uh, it's extremely small. And obviously, if this does go to zero, I'll be in bad news. So if I have too big a perturbation, I will readily accept it, right? Um, and, and yet, if I do accept it, I will have really moved, you know, in terms of distance. And so what you want is a Goldilocks sort of thing. You want to get a big enough move at a time that you're exploring this well, but that the acceptance rate is still pretty high. And different MCMC practitioners <coughs> differ on what the criteria is for this. The, there's, there's uh, a, um, a school of thought, um, most notably in uh, Gelman and uh, articulated in the pages of Bayesian data analysis, a great book on Bayesian data analysis, which I'd recommend in the highest terms, which recommends an acceptance rate of about upper 20%, so like 29%, 27%, something along those lines. And he goes through an argument in a separate paper, I think, about why that's a good acceptance rate from theoretical principles. But it's, it, it's kind of a, a smaller example, and I have some questions about how it generalizes as to Dr. Liu. Um, there's other practitioners who says, no, you want an acceptance rate if possible. If possible, you want an acceptance rate that's like 80% or something, if you can, if you can. Um, what I will note is that Tuning the acceptance rate is a big part of MCMC and by extension PMCMC. We, we adjust, and one of the key things that determines it, not the only thing, but one of the key things is the size of these perturbations. The size of this delta theta, which we draw randomly from a, this perturbation. If this is too big, then we may have a very low acceptance rate. If it's too small, we have a high acceptance rate, but we don't move around enough. And really what we want is to explore this a lot. So we want acceptance rate that's pretty high for a decent sized step, which will allow us to explore. Because after all, if we, if we have it really low and we don't, so low, but we accept every time, we're still not gonna move around and explore much. If we have it too high, um, we're also not going to move around and explore much. So we want a kind of Goldilocks sort of thing in terms of exploration. Okay, um, and all this holds for PMCMC as well. Um, uh, 
Okay, um, so that's one thing. Um, acceptance rates, yeah, some of argued this is this is going on, I think point point two three or in one D point four four. In general, this will be in many dimensions. You're tuning many parameters at once. And you have this right, because you have like a C, you have a beta, you have a, a delta or a or a a, a tau and, and you wanna you want to sample from the, the simulation model with with multiples of them. Okay. Um uh do 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 um uh, if you have high covariance between parameters, it lowers the efficiency. If, if, if increasing one means you have to lower the other for it to be any good, it'll tend to sample less with lower acceptance rate because you're going to be choosing one, and unless you choose the other in line with that, you're going to be rejecting it. And, and in these cases, sometimes you do variable transforms. Um, uh, sometimes you end up... Um, uh, you'll, you'll end up uh, doing, there's a thing called block MCMC where you're sampling from blocks at a time of joint things. You sample jointly from two things that are highly covariant. Um, uh, right, uh, there are cases where you thin out, the, you throw out all but one over N of the things you're sampling if you're concerned about autocorrelation. And you want, a key thing is you want to assess convergence. You've got to be sampling until um, you have what's, what's viewed as convergence. You've sampled well the, the uh, distribution, the posterior distribution. And there's tests like the Heidelberg-Welch test and a many Walker's test that you can run in tools like R um, to basically test, is this well converged? Is it well mixed? Um, and uh, experienced practitioners of this, like Dr. Liu, myself, others, can often look at a trace plot which shows the values of parameters over time and will say, ah, oh, it's clearly not mixed because it's just going really slowly amongst that. You want something that's kind of looking like it's exploring all sorts of different values over time. So you want a trace plot of sort of iterations on the x-axis and value of the parameter on the y-axis that looks like it, it's really moving quickly to explore all different values of this parameter. Um, there's many variants of the algorithm. I've only shown you one, um, Metrop uh, Random Walk, Metropolis, Hastings. Um, uh, Dr. Liu is like a foremost expert in this and, and she can talk with you more. We've worked with Game the Sampling together as well, um, but uh, Random Walk, Metropolis, Hastings is our workhorse for, um, for most of our work. Um, there's really sophisticated additional approaches that are really interesting. Something called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and um, something called Reverse Jump Monte, Marco Chain Monte Carlo, which allows you, get this, to sample between parameter, between different models when those models have different numbers of parameters within them. Um, it's not too bad to sample between models with MCMC if the models have identical parameter sets. In other words, it's two models which have the same basic parameters parameterizing them. But if you have different possible models that have, say, different number of compartments, and you want to sample models according to their probability of applying, you will want to, um, um, you will want to uh, use something like reverse jump. But it's very sophisticated. Talk with Dr. Liu before even thinking about it. Um, uh, right. Um, and this presaged our, our particle filtering. Okay, um, MCMC is used with deterministic models, typically. If you're going to use it with a stochastic model, you can do so in the context of the, of the particle filtering the version, the PMCMC, okay. Um, here, we're computing, we're drawing from, we're estimating posterior distributions of any model parameter and by extension of model variables over time, okay? Um, and uh, a capacity to describe a probabilistic model in MCMC gives clarity about the distributional assumptions. Um, it permits greater robustness in model conclusions uh, to what degree they hold for wide ranges of parameter values. Um, and um, here we're gonna be tomorrow using this to estimate both parameters sampling from parameter values, 
where we hold up data and we see what does it imply about the distribution over my parameters of my model, which parameter values are more likely or less likely. We're going to combine that with particle filtering, which allows you to take that data and see what it tells you about the latent state. And we'll see how we can sample from both of these jointly, where we can sample from parameter values and state trajectories as, as, um, as sampled by particle filtering. So those are my comments on uh, MCMC. I know this is a lot to end the day with. There's a lot of substance there. This is challenging material. Um, but big picture, I hope it lets you understand that here we are taking data from the world and a model, and we are saying, tell us what this implies about the distribution over parameters that I don't know well. It'll tell you, it'll tell you things like P has to be high when C is low, and C has to be high if P is low, and they covariate kind of like in this distribution. And that's really useful. Um, part of MCMC can be used when you don't have time series data. This, we did this with time series here. But in general, you don't need time series data. You can, have data of arbitrary sorts. Particle filtering is really used with time series. It's used with data over time on um, incoming data. This could be used more generally than that, but this is one way of turning that data about the world together with model assumptions into insight into parameter values. And tomorrow, we will see how to do this with turning that data into insight, both about what's going on underneath the model in terms of the latent state, which we're uncertain about, and in terms of parameters, jointly, okay? So that's for tomorrow morning, the grand crescendo, okay, um, with P PMC of C, okay? And if, you, if you're not inspired by the crescendo, there'll be some really good croissants too, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Thanks very much. Did you find any efficiencies in terms of the burn-in period? Like, did you did you not need as much of a burn-in period? Good question. Because I think is that because I, I use Stan, which is I think yeah. from from Goldman yes, and indeed. Bob Carpenter. Indeed, we've used that some. Yeah. And, and so I think because they use a no U-turn sample. Exactly. And so I think one of the criticisms, well, the one of the reasons they moved to that, I think, was to get better efficiencies in the posterior. Yes. Yes, we've used Stan some. Um, Interestingly, I would um, talk with Dr. Liu about yeah, that because um, yeah. she has some interesting observations about Stan's limitations. Yeah, okay. 